individuals and large institutions alike are allocating more of their dollars to investment strategies that meet some level of environmental, social, and governance criteria. This is commonly referred to as responsible, sustainable, or green investing. I'll use sustainable to describe it in this video. According to the 2018 Global Sustainable Investment Review, as of the start of 2018, more than 25% of US domiciled assets under management were invested in sustainable strategies. In Canada, it is just over 50% at 2.1 trillion in Canadian dollar terms. That's up 42% since 2016. BlackRock, one of the world's largest asset managers, recently committed to making sustainability a key part of their investment process. This growth in sustainable investing is good news to the extent that sustainable investing leads to positive social impact. But it also has some important implications for expected investment outcomes. I'm Ben Felix, Portfolio Manager at PWL Capital. In this episode of Common Sense Investing, I'm going to tell you how you can align your investments with your views and values. But it's probably going to cost you. The two most common types of sustainable investment strategies are negative screening and ESG integration. Negative screening eliminates certain sectors, companies, or practices from a portfolio. ESG integration is more of a re-weighting. Instead of completely eliminating industries, an integration strategy will underweight companies with lower ESG scores and increase the weight of companies with higher ESG scores. There are index funds that employ both of these strategies, often in combination with each other. Having a sustainable portfolio sounds like a really good idea, and it might feel even better than it sounds. However, I think that you need to consider two equally important factors in deciding to implement a sustainable investment strategy. The first factor is the impact on your expected returns, and the second is the extent to which the investment actually reflects your views and values. These two considerations need to be assessed jointly. If a sustainable portfolio has slightly lower expected returns but is a perfect reflection of your views and values, you may be willing to accept the trade-off. But accepting the lower expected returns of a sustainable portfolio that does not reflect your specific set of views and values might not be a trade-off that most investors should consider. Let's start with the impact of socially responsible investing on expected returns. The effect of ESG scores on stock returns was examined in a 2019 paper by Rocco Cicciaretti, Ambrogio Dallo, and Lemurjan Dam. They controlled for common risk factors and looked at a global sample of 5,972 firms for the period 2004 through 2018. They found that companies with higher ESG scores tended to deliver lower average returns than companies with lower ESG scores. They found a statistically significant negative premium for the ESG characteristic in a traditional Fama French five-factor regression, a six-factor regression including momentum, and a seven-factor regression including an ESG risk factor. They found that a one standard deviation decrease in the ESG score is associated with a 0.13% increase in monthly expected returns. Put simply, Controlling for exposure to known drivers of returns, companies with higher ESG scores tend to do worse than companies with lower ESG scores. The authors considered two possible explanations for this observation, both grounded in economic theory. ESG characteristics reflect investor preferences, or ESG characteristics are captured by some underlying ESG risk factor. Based on the previously mentioned factor regressions, they found it much more likely that it is an investor preference that drives a negative ESG premium. Investors may be willing to accept lower expected returns simply because they do not want to invest in certain types of firms. This is not a risk premium, but an effect of investor tastes. That word, tastes, is important. In their 2007 paper, Disagreements, Tastes, and Asset Prices, Eugene Fama and Ken French explained that investors may hold an asset partially as a consumption good, regardless of its expected return profile, if they have a taste for that asset. If enough wealth is controlled by investors with specific tastes, such as the case of sustainable investors, the effect on prices could be meaningful. Another way to think about this is that investors with a taste for sustainable investments require higher expected returns to be convinced to invest in an unsustainable company. This drives up the expected returns of unsustainable companies. They are also willing to accept lower expected returns to invest in sustainable companies. This drives down the expected return of sustainable companies. In a 2019 study, Olivier David Zerbib developed an asset pricing model including premiums for ESG exclusion and investor tastes. 
The premiums for exclusion are related to the increased risk of stocks that are neglected by sustainable investors. The premium for investor tastes is related to the cost of externalities that sustainable investors internalize to maximize their welfare instead of the market value of their investments. Using this model, Zabib analyzed U.S. stock data between 2000 and 2018. He found an exclusion effect of 2.5% per year and a taste effect of 1.5% per year. These effects show the approximate magnitude of underperformance driven by, respectively, a negative screen and an integrated approach to a sustainable portfolio over the time period examined. As ESG preferences grow stronger, the expectation is that these pricing effects will become more pronounced. In a 2019 paper, Lubos Pastor, Robert Stambaugh, and Lucianne Taylor constructed a theoretical model to examine the implications of ESG investing on expected returns. They again found that firms with higher ESG scores have lower expected returns. And those expected returns get lower when risk aversion is low and ESG sensitivity is high. They also found that the size of the ESG investment industry increases as the dispersion of ESG preferences increases. I know that was a lot to take in, so think about it this way. If everyone has the same ESG preferences, the same willingness to invest in bad companies if the expected return is high enough, and to invest in good companies despite a low expected return, then everyone will hold the market portfolio and be happy. There will be no ESG investing industry if everyone has the same preferences. If there are two groups, one group with no ESG preferences and one group with strong ESG preferences, then there is an ESG investing industry. As the dispersion in ESG preferences grows, the ESG investing industry gets bigger and expected returns for sustainable portfolios get lower. Pastor, Stambaugh, and Taylor also found that sustainable investing leads to positive social impact by encouraging sustainable firms to invest more while discouraging unsustainable firms from investing due to the effects of investor preferences on their cost of capital. Let's recap. Yes, you can encourage change in the world by investing in companies that meet ESG criteria. But as long as there is dispersion in ESG preferences, you are doing so at the expense of lower expected returns. This joint effect must be true. If sustainable investing works the way that it is supposed to, by putting pressure on unsustainable companies, then the firms excluded from sustainable portfolios must have higher expected returns meaning sustainable investors must have lower expected returns than the preference-free market. I think that we have established that investors should expect lower risk-adjusted returns from a sustainable portfolio. A portfolio with a negative screen that entirely eliminates industries will tend to be more impactful to expected returns than a portfolio with an integration approach that reweights companies based on their ESG score. In either case, lower expected returns are a consideration for investors with above-average ESG preferences reflected in their portfolio. Lower expected returns are not the only cost that sustainable investors endure. By definition, a sustainable portfolio must be less diversified than the market. A reduction in diversification reduces the reliability of the investment outcome. If companies with high ESG scores had higher expected returns, the increased concentration and decreased reliability could be viewed as a reasonable trade-off. But companies with higher ESG scores have lower expected returns. We are getting a less reliable portfolio with a lower expected return, not an optimal trade-off. We also have to consider fees. A globally diversified portfolio of Canadian-listed iShares ESG ETFs comes with a cost of around 0.28% per year while a similar iShares ETF portfolio with no ESG consideration would cost 0.12% per year. Lower expected returns, less diversification, and higher fees are the costs of a sustainable portfolio. These costs exist on a continuum. The more sustainable that we want to get, the higher the costs tend to get. If we start on one end of the spectrum, we might have XIC, the iShares Core S&P TSX Capped Composite Index ETF. No ESG filter, market cap weighted, 235 holdings, and a 0.06% expense ratio. It will almost certainly deliver the market's return after costs. XESG, the iShares ESG MSCI Canada Index ETF, favors companies with high ESG scores. It has 129 holdings and an expense ratio of 0.22%. MSCI has designed the index to have an expected 1% tracking error so you expect to get the market return plus or minus some random error. If we wanted more sustainability, we would need to increase the tracking error budget and expect higher fees. 
For example, the Desjardins RI Canada Low CO2 Index ETF has 63 holdings, more exclusions, and stricter ESG criteria. It has an expense ratio of 0.29%. As we move along this continuum of trade-offs, the higher costs might be worthwhile if the result is a portfolio that increasingly aligns with your views and values. But this is one of the biggest problems that sustainable investors face. There is a huge difference between investing in a product with ESG, green, or sustainable in its name, and investing in a way that aligns with your values. Even the rating agencies that determine the ESG scores don't agree on the definitions. This was explored in a 2019 paper by Florian Berg, Julian Colbell, and Roberto Rigobon. They looked at ratings from five prominent ESG rating agencies and found that their ESG ratings have an average correlation of 0.61 with a range between 0.42 and 0.73. The disagreement is driven nearly equally by differences in ESG definitions and differences in how those definitions are measured. For context, credit ratings from Moody's and Standard & Poor's are correlated at 0.99. We can look at the MSCI Canada IMI Extended ESG Focus Index as an example. This index takes an integration approach combined with total exclusions for tobacco, controversial weapons, producers of or ties with civilian firearms, and businesses involved in severe controversies. All good things to avoid for a socially conscious investor. Now here's the issue. One of its largest holdings is Suncor, a Canadian energy company specializing in synthetic crude production from oil sands. More than 16% of the index is made up of energy companies. A different index provider, FTSE, creates ESG indexes that exclude oil, gas, and coal companies. They don't exclude downstream companies like pipelines, but it's still a step in the right direction. This difference in ESG index construction should not be a surprise. From the Berg, Colbell, and Rigobon paper, we can see that energy specifically is a major point of disagreement across ESG rating agencies, with an average rating correlation of only 0.29 at the energy category level. The inclusion or exclusion of oil and gas companies in an ESG index is only one example of a larger problem. Name your social or environmental issue of choice, and different index providers are likely to treat it differently. Similarly, if an index provider treats one issue the way that you would hope, they might not align with your views on other issues. This is a big problem from two perspectives. Investors might end up enduring the higher costs of a sustainable portfolio while owning companies that conflict with their values. And companies might be confused about which actions they need to take to improve their ESG performance. Approaching the sustainable investing problem successfully ends up requiring precise management of the trade-offs between implicit and explicit costs and your specific set of views and values. The perfect portfolio from the perspective of views and values could end up being too under-diversified, too expensive, or otherwise impractical. On the other hand, the simplest, cheapest, and most diversified portfolio is likely to conflict, on some level, with the views and values of most sustainable-minded investors. Step one for a sustainable investor is understanding that as long as there is dispersion in ESG preferences, sustainable portfolios have lower risk-adjusted returns. Step two is making a decision about the acceptable level of portfolio trade-offs in meeting the ESG preferences that you have, where stronger ESG preferences will generally mean less diversification, lower expected returns, and higher costs. Step three is probably the most important step. It is verifying that the products that you have selected truly reflect the views and values that have motivated you to be a sustainable investor. Thanks for watching. My name is Ben Felix of PWL Capital, and this is Common Sense Investing. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with someone who you think could benefit from the information. Don't forget, if you have run out of Common Sense Investing videos to watch, you can tune in to weekly episodes of the Rational Reminder podcast wherever you get your podcasts.